Good evening and welcome to Journey Home. My guest this evening, James Aiken, who is a convert and is presently the, the uh, an apologist, senior apologist for Catholic Answers, will share in a moment his very moving journey to the Catholic Church. But the theme that we've chosen for this evening is biblical worship. And if I were to phrase that question the way I may have in the past when I was a Protestant minister, what is the most biblical way for us to worship God? And to start this off, there's a, a psalm, Psalm 95, which has been the source of many, many hymns for worship, which maybe puts, puts this question uh, in a bracket. This psalm in verse 6 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Now that verse begs the question, because I remember as a Presbyterian pastor, if I wanted to put that verse into practice, that I do not ever remember a worship in our church where we bowed, we knelt down. So if we want to do biblical worship, how do we determine what is the correct way of worshiping our Lord. Is the correct way or does it not matter? We'll look at that this evening and your questions on this topic of biblical, essential, important, correct, uh, sin uh, sincere and heartfelt worship of our loving Lord. Your questions are very important about this tonight so call us at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. James, finally, welcome to the Journey Home program. Thank you very much, Mike. I don't know why it's taken so long. We've, I've thought about it for you, as long as we've had the program. Well, better late than never. I'm just glad to be here. And you and I, you know, in a sense, had a relationship before we really knew each other because your story was also published with mine in the book Surprised by Truth. Mm -hmm. That's where I first heard your conversion story. Mm -hmm. And I'm anxious for you to tell the details to our audience. Let's begin as we always do. Give them some background, your early spiritual journey, if you would. Okay, well, um, I was born in South Texas, and I grew up in uh, the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. And as many people may know, the Church of Christ, uh, Campbellites is another term that's used, is very strong in those areas. And my family was Church of Christ. And so early on, I was taken to the Church of Christ every Sunday. Um, was made to dress up in a little suit and for some reason I, I never liked Sunday I thought it was called Sunday because it was so hot <laughs> but uh, at least that's the way the suit made me feel yeah. um, but uh, when I was about six or seven my parents stopped attending the Church of Christ and so after that I was raised pretty much outside of any church I mm -hmm. considered myself a Christian but didn't really know the faith didn't really know Christ and so you it, missed those formative years of that would have been, let's say, Sunday school or catechesis. Pretty, pretty much completely. The only time we went to church in those years was when we would visit my grandparents in Texas. And uh, so, as a result of not being catechized, I drifted in my teenage years into the New Age movement, and I spent some time as a New Ager. But then, when I was around 20 years old or so, I broke with the New Age movement because. The New Age movement teaches that one must achieve perfection by human effort without grace. Mm -hmm. And I realized, <laughs> looking at my heart, especially at that time of life, there wasn't any way I was going to be able to do that, <laughs> at least not in this lifetime. So <laughs> I, uh, I spent a couple years drifting, and then eventually I, uh, I found uh, a minister who I would listen to and from whom I began to perceive the message of Christ and I decided to become a Christian and I, at the time I did not I wasn't solid in the faith yet I thought Christianity must have something over the other religions but maybe not much and I didn't really know what it was but I was going to be a Christian and so then I started studying the New Testament and then the Old Testament and I began to realize hey these are serious historical documents I mean this isn't just all a bunch of myth this really happened mm -hmm. Jesus Christ really lived he really rose from the dead mm -hmm and he is really the Lord and God and so I just was consumed with a passion to know more about Christ and about his word and it was my fondest uh, desire to eventually end up becoming a pastor or seminary professor so that I could devote my life to learning more about Jesus Christ and that's what I was planning to do I uh, was in a Protestant context I'd never been uh, raised Catholic or anything so I was viewing it all uh, through a Protestant lens, you might say, mm -hmm. 
And that was something that I began to perceive some problems with. Even when I first read the Bible through, I noticed certain verses that really didn't sound Protestant to me, like whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven, and baptism now saves you. And I read these verses in the New Testament, and I thought, wow, those, those really sound Catholic. But I said to myself, well, I'm a new Christian. I don't know a whole lot. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of put those verses on the shelf for a while. And then later on when I know more, I'll figure out what they mean. And so that really is kind of a summary of my early spiritual development. Uh, I very much wanted to be uh, a pastor or a seminary professor. I studied the theologies of all different groups of Christians, Catholics included, uh, because I didn't want to just reflexively fall into a particular mode of Christianity without really studying and figuring out which really does best correspond with what I was reading in Scripture. I love it when I hear conversion stories all the time and hear common elements. And you talked about that, um, that hunger that you had, which was a new hunger. Mm -hmm. to learn scripture and to me that always reminds me of what the spiritual writers talk about as a second conversion, the reawakening. Would you look back on that as truly what some may have called that a reawakening for your life, a really deep conviction? It, it really Christ? was. I had been interested in religion and philosophy my entire life. I mean that was even part of the searching in the New Age movement. It was a, a, a fundamental desire to be in touch with what's ultimately real and what lies behind just the world of the empirical senses you know that uh, that we experience in everyday life I wanted to get in touch with the source and God eventually led me to him <laughs> power of grace looking back then with our subject being biblical worship now as a at that point as an elder in the Presbyterian Church PC uh, no I was a layman under care of session that okay. means in their context that I was the the board of elders had taken me under their care with an eye to advancing a career in ministry for me okay, that was your trajectory at Correct. that point how would you understand then biblical worship well basically <clears throat> I found that it that many elements of biblical worship were present in my environment in evangelical churches. Uh, for example, if you read in the New Testament, it's very clear that the reading of Scripture and preaching on Scripture were to be part of biblical worship, and, and so was singing. And of course, those are all present in typical American evangelical worship. In fact, I sometimes have referred to uh, uh, Presbyterian liturgy as a hymn sandwich. It's uh, a sermon sandwiched between two hymns. And, uh, You've also got to include everything's done decently and in an order, though. Decently and in an order, <laughs> yes. Uh, but I also found many elements in Scripture that talked about worship. You alluded to kneeling and bowing, for example. Those are clearly part of biblical worship. They're clearly biblical postures of prayer, and those I didn't find reflected in my experience. Hmm. Well, then what opened your heart to looking at the Catholic Church? That wasn't part of your tradition at all. Right, it certainly wasn't. And I would have been very surprised to learn that I was going to end up as a Catholic. But what happened was I uh, fell in love with a young woman named Renee, and she was a Catholic. She also had a New Age background, but with my help, she lost the New Age background. And I could not marry her if she, as long as she was a Catholic if I was going to be a Protestant minister. Um, so what happened was she ended up... You felt that pressure within your tradition. Within Protestant. my tradition. In, in conservative Presbyterianism, I would never have been offered a position with a wife who was a Catholic. And I wouldn't have accepted a position even if it had been offered with a wife who was Catholic because Paul is very clear in the pastoral epistles that Christ's ministers must have religious solidarity within their families. Mm -hmm. And if I could not worship in the same church as my wife, if she and I were not part of the same church, mm -hmm. then in conscience I couldn't have put myself forward as a candidate for such a position. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of conscience. Well, we got married. And immediately after we got married, she went back to the Catholic Church, which of course <laughs> derailed my career. Um, but uh, but it, it was a sacrifice that, uh, that I was prepared to follow, to follow through with as a Christian husband because when you make a commitment, it's more it, maritally, it is more important yeah. than your job. Yeah. And so uh, I still had hopes of pursuing it one day. And in fact, I started studying Catholic theology in order to try to argue my wife out of the church. But <laughs> the more I read, the more things I found 
in scripture that really matched up with the Catholic faith. And the turning point probably came one day in August of 1991 when I was reading a Catholic book and there was an extended quotation from Matthew 16, which is the UR Peter passage. And as I read this passage, I, I, I typically to this point said what many evangelicals say, which is that Peter is not the rock, but that the rock on which the church is built is Peter's faith, the revelation of the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. And I had assumed in this passage that Jesus was diminishing Peter, saying, you're not important, Peter. The real important thing is who I am as Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, as I read the passage on this day, I noticed certain structural features in the text that required me to say that Peter's the rock. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I saw them, it, it was locked in place. I realized it had to be. And so I did an about face on the interpretation of that mm -hmm. passage. and just in a moment and said, this is it, this is crystal clear, it has to be Peter. And as a result of that, maybe, I... Maybe you better give us the sure, bit of that detail. No problem. Because um, I think it is interesting what you've discovered. Now. One of the, what I noticed was that in this passage, Jesus makes three statements to Peter. The first statement he makes begins, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. The second statement is, you are Peter, begins that way. And the third statement begins, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, what I noticed is that the first statement, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, is clearly a blessing. Mm -hmm. The third statement, I give you the keys, is also clearly a blessing. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to interpret you are Peter in its immediate context, then we're going to have to say that you are Peter is also a blessing. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is... It would be inconsistent to bless him, but then exactly. put him down and Exactly. It would be like saying, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, you're really insignificant. Here are the keys to the kingdom. You know, it just wouldn't scan. And so um, I had to conclude that what the linguists were saying was right. Now, sometimes, you know, Protestants will say, well, there's a different word in Greek here. It's, he's saying, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. And that's true. But what they will sometimes argue is that Petros means small stone, whereas Petra means large rock. And so he's contrasting Peter with the rock. Well, if he had said that in Greek about six or seven hundred years earlier, it would have carried that meaning. In some early Greek poetry, they did have that meaning. But as D.A. Carson, who's one of the deans of Protestant biblical exegesis, admits, by the first century, the terms had lost that meaning. They were synonyms. And so you really can't drive a wedge between them in that way. So I realized that uh, because it's in a context of blessing, the middle statement, you are Peter, also has to be a blessing. And so he's not running Peter down and contrasting him with the rock. I also noticed that um, each one of these three statements has a continuation which explains it. So for the statement, uh, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, the continuation is, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That explains why he's blessed, because the Father has revealed this to him. Similarly, in the third statement, I give you the keys, the continuation and explanation is whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That explains part of what it means to have the keys. So in the same way with the middle statement, you are Peter, the continuation of that, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that explains what it means to be Peter. Mm -hmm. To be Peter means to be the rock on which the church is built. And so I had to conclude, wow, if Catholics were right about that, they could be right about other things. And so I had to conduct a survey over the course of a year of all of the different areas of systematic theology, looking at them for the first time, really, with an open mind to the Catholic position. When I did, the verses came back down off the shelf, and I said, Jesus meant what he said, and I have to become a Catholic. That last part of your journey in is very moving. I don't know if you want to get into detail. Be happy that, to. Yeah. Um, I hid what I was doing religiously from my wife for a while because we had a very good marriage and the only real sore spot was the religion issue. And I didn't want to get her hopes up about me becoming a Catholic if it wasn't going to work out and, and she would just be crushed. So I kind of snuck around studying Catholic stuff saying, oh, this is just for ecumenical, you know, honey, I've always studied all different groups of Christians. and. <laughs> And uh, I was uh, calling Catholic Answers, and people from Catholic Answers were calling me. And, she, and when I finally told her, 
she told me that she had thought that it was just ecumenical stuff, that she had no idea that I was really looking at becoming Catholic. And things were going well. But then uh, in June of 1992, she got sick. And her health had always been delicate. Um, and she became very ill. And at first we thought that it was simply a continuation of, of her standard uh, health issues. But we discovered after a month that it wasn't. It may have been based on them, but it was really a new health issue and it went much farther and was much graver than we had ever suspected. She had advanced colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And at the point that we discovered it, it had already spread through her body. We tried chemotherapy, though the doctor said it's only going to slow things down at best, and it didn't even do that. The kind that she had was just too aggressive, and she died in August of 92, just over two months after having her first symptom. So it went quickly, but it was also a very grace-filled time, and God gave me a number of consolations that make me very... Uh, reassured uh, about her state and also he brought me into the church at that point. In fact, I was received into the Catholic Church on August 22nd, which is of course the Queenship of Our Lady, and I was received in her hospital room and the priest used the emergency shortened form. I had a conditional baptism. I went to confession first and had a conditional baptism, confirmation, and then for the first and last time she and I shared the Eucharist together. That's that's wonderful, uh, powerful way God works in grace in our lives in lots yeah. of ways. It was, and then uh, then she died four days later, uh, and uh, it was a, a very painful but grace-filled time. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Let's go with this, the topic for tonight. Okay. Now, how do you understand biblical worship? What have you come to discover as a Catholic? What I have discovered as a Catholic regarding biblical worship is a much broader appropriation of the forms of worship that we see in the Bible. Um, it isn't just the partial representation that I found in my evangelical experience. In Catholic worship, we do bow. We bow in every single Mass. We do kneel. We kneel in every single Mass. Uh, we even, in certain liturgies, such as the ordination liturgy, other postures of prayer, such as prostration, are used. That's clearly in the Bible. And so, um, just in terms of our own actions, as individual worshipers, there is a much broader appropriation. Um, you find things in Catholic worship such as incense and uh, choral traditions that are based on ancient uh, biblical musical modalities. Chant ultimately comes from uh, the ancient modalities that were used in the temple in, uh, in ancient Israel. And so we find a, just a much greater range of these things. And one of the things that Catholic liturgy is very good about that Protestant services, at least in evangelical circles, really don't have is a recognition of the fact that the earthly liturgy is simply an outworking or manifestation or participation in the heavenly liturgy that is constantly going on. This is something that is stressed in the Bible. Uh, when God has the tabernacle built and later the temple, he's, he's very clear on the fact that you need to follow these patterns exactly because it corresponds, at least in a metaphorical way, to the worship that is constantly going on in heaven. And similarly, he has, when the ta tabernacle and later the temple are made, he has images of angels either woven or carved into the very walls of the worship space to indicate, and statues of them as well, to indicate that this is an elevation of the earthly to the heavenly, and that we really are participating in the heavenly worship when we worship here on earth in the liturgy. That's a fact that is almost completely absent from typical American evangelical worship experience, but it's very clear even in the New Testament when we see in Revelation, we, we, we see what's going on in heaven, it's worship and it's a liturgical worship because they are using the accoutrements that one would find in the temple on earth. The angels are using trumpets and they're using uh, golden dishes and they're using incense and they're using all of the trappings mm 
that one would experience in uh, first century Jewish worship. Well, if it is that clear scripturally, which it is as you described, and, and since it's such a central part of shaping both Catholic as well as Eastern Orthodox worship, then why did Christ then Protestantism so quickly jettison all of that? It depends really on what kind of Protestants you're talking about. Obviously, Anglicans departed very little from, uh, from traditional Christian worship, and we really have to say that that's what that is. Traditional Christian worship is liturgical worship, whether it's Catholic or Orthodox or um, Coptic, Armenian, whatever, it's all liturgical. Uh, because it's just an organic continuation of the worship that was set up in the church in the first century. And Anglicans departed very little from it, Lutherans a bit more. Uh, in Calvinism and, and some of the later sects, as the Reformation gets older, you start getting more and more departure. And really, the Baptist tradition, which began in the, uh, in the early 1600s, of course it was founded by John Smith, who was an expatriate Englishman living in Holland, uh, the Baptist tradition and the Puritan tradition really tried to just jettison everything and reconstruct from the ground up. And that's when you got a large-scale jettisoning of things. And many things were rejected, I think, specifically because they were Catholic, uh, such as the use of incense. It's unquestionably biblical, including in the New Testament period. You see it in Revelation, in the New Testament era. It's clearly a biblical, uh, an element of biblical worship, but because it was used by Catholics, those who wish to purify the Christian community from Romish practices um, rejected it in spite of the fact that it was biblical simply because it was Catholic. As is bowing and, and As kneeling. As bowing and kneeling. and Very all, scriptural. All those things. Um, and now we, you know, you have the Quaker movement where you have some movement where there's almost no where there's no set aspect of worship at all. Exactly. In fact, many Quaker uh, worship meetings are are silent and people just sit and wait for the spirit to lead them to say something. Complete. And so it's just very structureless. Uh, well, let me ask a question that someone may ask. Uh, given this great diversity and all the other things going on, I mean, why is this really important? I mean, it, mm -hmm. does it really make a difference to God how and when and where we worship? The answer to that is yes and no. Um, it doesn't make a difference to God if we worship him very ineptly so long as we are doing our best. Um, all of us uh, lisp his praise, so to speak. None of us are, 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 are perfect in this life, and so God uh, contents himself with our imperfect, flawed worship. Um, it also doesn't matter to God when we are worshiping him, it's not like he won't hear our prayers at certain times or won't receive our praise at certain times. But God has also designed humans to be creatures of habit and pattern and structure. We need that. We need that as, as, as a society. Without those, society disintegrates into anarchy. God meant us to be social beings and to worship him in a social manner, not just individually when we're free to worship him whenever we wish, but also corporately. And it's very clear in Scripture that corporate worship is extremely important to God. It's something that God really has mandated for us as a way of approaching Him. And so, for example, uh, we see in the Old Testament God setting the Sabbath as a weekly holy day. And there was also the monthly holy day of the new moon and the seven annual feasts of the Lord and so forth. And they were compulsory. Uh, and if one violated them, one was in for significant uh, consequences. In fact, in, obviously in, in, the, uh, in the Pentateuch, there is the story of a gentleman who was found picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And he was taken before Moses, who consulted with God, said, what do we do with this guy? He's broken the Sabbath. The answer was, stone him. And so, uh, so certain, uh, certain uh, abuses of the uh, of, right. of divine worship then could even actually have carried the death penalty. And, and sometimes it seems to me that, and I've mentioned this on the program before, but I think especially in this area it's true, where often the difference between Catholic and Protestant is that in, in Protestantism we have an either or, mm -hmm. either or, whereas in, Protest in Catholicism you'll find a both and mm -hmm. in aspects of, of worship. And one thing that comes to mind is that statement in the Old Testament where the prophets are saying that God doesn't want sacrifice, he wants a broken heart. Right, and so as Protestants, we we pitted those against one another, mm -hmm. and took all of sacrifice out of worship because right. what God really wants 
is a broken and new heart. Right, but when you read those passages in the prophets and in the Psalms, it makes it clear that God wants the broken heart to then lead yes. to renewed sacrificial worship. So in Psalm, uh, in Psalm 50, the great penitential Psalm, uh, after David says, you know, wash me and I will be whiter than snow and so forth, he says, then bulls will be altered on your, offer, on your altar righteously and so forth. So the broken heart, the contrition, the mercy, and all of that is meant to lead us into renewed liturgical worship. That's such a great explanation of it, because I, I think we're touching at maybe one of the reasons why so many seem today to move away from kneeling and bowing. It's an either or. Okay, sure, many people knelt out of habit mm -hmm. without a change of heart, but right. it isn't an either or. It isn't an either or. And that's something, on the subject of kneeling and bowing, that's something that is of particular I guess Americans are particularly susceptible to that kind of thing because in this country we don't have a tradition of royalty where one kneels and in fact Americans in in the past have been very proud of the fact that they don't kneel to royalty and that we have a democratic government which is wonderful but liturgically it causes some people to feel that there's something somehow demeaning about that and there's nothing demeaning about it at all of course it's simply recognizing our proper place before the infinite all good God who made us and of course we want to assume a humble posture in his presence. Uh, we would, I have a couple of the questions about worship and I'll let uh, the callers decide what they would like to ask. You're an apologist for Catholic Answers. Mm -hmm. How did an apologist come to write a book called Mass Confusion uh, which is published by Catholic Answers, right? The do's and don'ts of Catholic worship. That's correct. Um, as an apologist, I, my job is to ex defend and explain the faith. And so my primary function really doesn't deal with liturgy at all. I was not an expert on the liturgy. But what happened is we received, a, and still do, receive yeah. a great many questions concerning the liturgy. And I had to go look up the answers. And eventually I thought, man, I'm going to get these liturgy questions out of my hair once and for all. I'm going to write something. It'll just be a little booklet that will answer all of the common questions about liturgy and then I'll be able to say here have this booklet I can get on with being an apologist and not have to worry about liturgy well of course it didn't work out that way um, ironically now that I looked up the answers I get asked to talk about the liturgy all the time but uh, at least now I know the answers and so uh, so I'm more comfortable handling them. I wonder if this also came out of your own movement into the church because well how did you deal when you discovered in the Catholic Church that there's some uncomfortable diversity mm -hmm. in the church. That's something that dawned on me very slowly because of course coming from a non-liturgical tradition I had to learn Catholic liturgy from the ground up. It wasn't something that I was initially comfortable with. In fact initially I thought well okay I know this is biblical worship but I'm just learning the ropes. Uh -huh. And uh, I sometimes advise people who are going to Mass for the first time if you come from a non-liturgical tradition don't really worry about joining in the first time. Just sit and watch and learn the structure and try as you can follow along with the book. But don't try to jump in feet first or it may be a little much for you your first time because it's a very rich tradition but it takes a little bit of time to learn. And as a Protestant visiting a Catholic church you may often feel self-conscious. Right and of course you shouldn't at all. It, people won't think you're strange or anything if you just sit and watch that's perfectly fine. They're focusing on somebody way up front. Yes. Jesus in the sacrament. That's right. That's the focus of Catholic worship. Well, thank you very much. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for James about, well, actually, since James is the senior apologist for Catholic Answers and is very accustomed to forum discussions, he'll take whatever question you would like tonight. So we'll be back with a moment with your questions. Welcome back. Our guest this evening is James Aiken, the Senior Apologist for Catholic Answers. We've been discussing biblical worship, and we'll talk more about that in, in a moment, but I think we're ready to take our first caller this evening. This is Matt from Chicago. Hello, Matt. What's your question for us tonight? Yes, thank you very much for taking my call, and I wanted to ask, 
which is more important, the Bible or the Catechism? That's a good question to ask an apologist because he's got to balance those two things the often in his work. Yeah, uh, the answer is it depends on what you're trying to use them for. In an ultimate sense, the Bible is more important than any individual catechism because the Bible is God's word itself. God picked the very words that are used in Scripture. On the other hand, God did not choose to write the Bible in such a way that it's entirely clear or even necessarily that it contains all of the emphases that need to be made uh, as part of the Christian faith. And for those, a catechism is, uh, is especially helpful. So it really depends what you're trying to do. Um, in Protestant circles, very often we had the idea that we could just give someone a Bible and they would be able to derive everything they need from it. And that's really not true. In fact, the American experience with the generation of countless uh, innumerable new and frankly bizarre sects like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Christian Scientists and all that um, has demonstrated the invalidity of that approach. And so for learning the faith for the first time, the catechism is, uh, is more valuable. But then you want to go beyond just learning the faith to supplement it with a serious study of God's Word. And that, in fact, is how Scripture was meant to be used. It wasn't meant to be an initial catechesis. It was meant to help people who already knew the faith of the true God go on to learn even more about Him. Say another word about the catechism. What is the foundation for the catechism? Well, the, if by the catechism we mean the catechism the of the catechism. Catholic Church, it is uh, a document that follows the traditional pattern of Christian catechesis. It uh, has sections on the... Uh, on the Creed, on the Ten Commandments, on the Lord's Prayer, and on um, the sacraments. And those are the four pillars of catechesis that have been used for centuries, even back in Thomas Aquinas' day. In fact, uh, some people may uh, see my webpage sometime. It's jamesaiken.com. And there I have actually a set of five historic catechisms from different centuries, and they all follow the same fourfold structure. And so I have it set up to where you can click back and forth between them and uh, see the different areas of catechesis as they were being presented in different eras. Great. Let's go with our first email tonight. This comes from Trinidad and Tobago, West Indies. Welcome. Selma, uh, dear Marcus and guest, I have many friends who are very spiritual yet do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. They say they do not read the Bible and cannot really get into it as it is hard to understand. Is there any way that one can start to read the Bible in a way that can be interesting and easy to understand? All my friends are Catholic. I would appreciate any help this way. I would say that it's difficult for me to imagine anyone who is genuinely spiritual but doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now sometimes uh, we don't use that phraseology of personal relationship or whatever. That phraseology really only goes back a little more than a hundred years. It's a new thing in Christian history, but Christians have had relationships with Christ for the last 2,000 well, years. Well, that's what Catholic mystical theology is, is how to grow closer in union with God. And nothing exactly. more practical than that. In terms of the specific question about reading the Bible for, uh, uh, in a way that is interesting and draws one closer to Christ, what I would say is you may want to start with some of the more accessible books of Scripture, such as the Psalms, which are, uh, of course, it's a, it's a hymn book. It was the hymn book during the Second Temple period and so in the Old Testament. And so by appropriating those prayers and making them your own, that's a good way. Of course, what, one of the most fundamental things you want to do is start learning the Gospels because they're the story of our Lord. And what I would suggest is starting with any one of the Gospels you want, but persevering in reading it. When I first read the Gospels, I found it difficult because they weren't a genre or style of literature that I was familiar with. It's a very ancient way of writing, and it took me a while to learn the conventions. And so the first time I read Matthew, I was just confused. And then I read Mark, and it was worse because Mark leaves out little clarifying details that Matthew adds. <laughs> but then by the time I got to Luke, it's, okay, I'm starting to get this. And then with John, I was all set. And so simply persevering in reading the Gospels will, even if it's difficult at first, it will ultimately help you get into Scripture. Yeah. And read them prayerfully. Yes. Yeah, and maybe take a, if you want to go to a New Testament letter, maybe a book like Philippians, which is an uplifting 
letter calling us to rejoice and to uh, commit ourselves. Philippians would be a great choice. That's right. Let's take our next caller, Dennis from Colorado. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Good evening, Marcus. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, in the Magnificat, the Virgin Mary says, I will rejoice in God my Savior. And as I understand the church's presentation of Mary as sinless, why does someone who is sinless need a Savior? Thank you, Dennis. Good question. Well, there are a couple of things to say here. First of all, the concept of salvation in Scripture is much broader than what we typically think of it as. We, in this era, tend to think of salvation as if it's only salvation from hell. But biblically, salvation is much more than that. It can, it can indicate not only salvation from hell and sin and so forth, but it can also indicate salvation from bad circumstances. Deliverance in war, for example, is shown as an example of God's salvation. And this is what I call temporal salvation rather than eternal salvation. If you actually look in the passage in the Magnificat, Mary is talking in terms of what at least sounds like or could plausibly be read as temporal salvation because she's saying, behold, God has delivered me from my lowly condition and so forth, and from now on all generations are going to call me blessed. So he's regarded the state of his handmaid. And so it could be that she's talking in those terms. But let's suppose she's not. Is it true that, that Mary needs a savior eternally? Of course, absolutely. The only way you get to be sinless is if you have a Savior. Um, God is one day going to render all of us, or at least all of us who make it to heaven, he's going to render us sinless. He simply did it for her early. And just as that will be the capstone of our salvation, he just yeah. gave her that early. So um, actually, Mary has been saved in a more spectacular way than we are because he gave her the fullness of salvation at the very beginning of her life. And she, therefore, is what the Catechism calls the most excellent fruit of redemption because she had redemption applied to her in the fullest way. And there's a, an, a, 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 a parallel that sometimes uh, some of the medieval writers would use. They'd say, which is, which is a greater form of salvation, pulling someone out of a muddy pit after they've fallen into it or before they fall into it? Um, I would much rather be saved in the former way rather than the latter, and that's how God chose to save Mary. Maybe another way to see it is, don't you think the most appropriate words we might hear, the moment we are able to enter in the beatific vision of God is, hail, full of grace. Oh, absolutely. Said to us, because of the work of God's grace. He will have filled us with, with grace at that point. That's what they'll say to us, and that's what he had said to Mary, the angel said to Mary at that time, because of what God had done in her life because of grace. Let's take this email, Diane in Ohio. Hello, Diane. Dear Marcus and James, I have found profound differences in the way that folks worship at Mass as I have attended parishes other than my own within my archdiocese. Some parishes stand during the Eucharistic prayer, others kneel. Some parishes hold hands during Our Father, others don't. Aren't all churches required to follow the church's prescriptions regarding the proper order of the Mass? Thank God for UWTN, The Journey Home, and Catholic Answers. All parishes are required to follow the, what the Holy See has laid down regarding the church's liturgical law. Um, there are, considerable, there is, there are cons a considerable number of options built into the liturgy. It's not monolithic. The, the church does allow options for things to be done differently in different settings. And that may account for some of the diversity that she is encountering. It may not account for all of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, she is, she's absolutely correct. Parishes are required to follow what the Holy See has laid down for the celebration of the liturgy in our country. Maybe ask, time to ask this question in your own journey into the church. How did you deal with the fact that sometimes you do attend a mass from here to there where they're not, they don't seem to be following? Well, I would lump that under the general heading of problems in the church because the Catholic Church is full of sinners, just like every church. And bad things happen, things that shouldn't happen in the Catholic Church, just like in every other church. I mean, we would expect that. After all, Jesus said, I came to call the sinners, not righteous. And so what I did when I was uh, just starting out in my journey towards the church was I said, look, I have to focus on what's true. It doesn't matter how bad circumstances are. Circumstances can always be bad. I have to focus on what's true. If the Catholic Church is true, if its theology is true, if it is the real church, then I have to be part of it. The solution, if there's a problem, is not to hop out of the lifeboat it's to hop into the lifeboat and start bailing. 
And a particular biblical incident was uh, instructive to me in this regard. If you look at the beginning of the first book of Samuel, we encounter Eli and his sons. And his sons are, are very wicked uh, priests. Um, they took portions of the offerings that they were not supposed to, so that was a liturgical abuse. They were also known for um, cohabiting with the women who served at the temple, and we've certainly seen parallels to that in not just the Catholic Church, but elsewhere in Christendom in this century. And what I said to myself was, look, if I had been a pagan and based my decision on whether to follow God on the performance of these priests, I would have said, oh, well, this can't be true. These guys are so unholy. They're committing all these horrible acts. And I would have stayed a pagan, and I would have missed the true religion. So what I have to do is not focus on the performance of individuals. I have to focus on the truth of the system. And that's a message of history, too. When you look at the history of the church. It's focusing on the passing on of the deposit of faith. That is what is essential, the core that draws us to Christ. Let's take our next caller. This is Judith from Louisiana. Hello, Judith. Your, what's your question for us tonight? Oh, hello. Uh, I heard your guest uh, ask, uh, mention earlier about loosening and binding. And uh, I was reading in the Bible this morning in Matthew 18 about loosening and binding. I wonder if you could expand on that a bit. Yes, thank you for your question. No problem. Um, the metaphors of loosing and binding were common in first century Judaism. And basically, there were two general meanings that were ascribed to those terms. The more common meaning that we find in the rabbis is the ability to make, a th to make or to abolish authoritative rules of conduct for the community. The, the Jewish term for those is halakha. And um, what Jesus was doing, at least in part, was giving the apostles the ability to establish or to remove authoritative rules of conduct for the Christian community. And th that's a power that the church has exercised down through the years. In fact, saying that the liturgy is to be celebrated this way and not some other way is an exercise of that power. So is um, the uh, former custom of, uh, of requiring meatless Fridays, uh, but not requiring it now. Now we're free to choose any penance we want on Friday. So that's an example of that. Now the other meaning that you find in some cases in Jewish writings of the period is the power to forgive and retain sins uh, being spoken of in terms of binding and loosing. And so both of those meanings are attested in Jewish writings uh, very early and that's the background against which we need to understand Jesus giving the apostles that authority. All right, let's take our next email. This comes from Katie. Mr. Aiken and Marcus, I have, now how come she called you Mr. And, uh, that's right. Uh, it's because she's more affectionate. I guess she no, knows you. She sees no, you every uh, week. It's the authority that you carry and no, the wisdom. No, no, no. I have a former Catholic, now fundamentalist friend that I just can't seem to get through to on the subject of temporal punishment. She thinks that since she has been born again and loves Jesus, that all of her sins, past, present, and future are taken care of because he died for them. Is there something obvious that can't be ignored in the Bible or an example I can use? Thank you and God bless. Death. <laughs> Death is the ultimate temporal punishment. Um, it is temporal because it's temporary. It occurs in time and it's not going to last forever. We're going to get resurrected. Uh, and it comes to us on account of the sin of our first parents. And it's something that uh, if she's been forgiven of all her sins and all of their consequences, temporal included, does she expect to live forever? Um, not in a physical sense, probably, unless, uh, unless Jesus chooses to come real soon. Um, now, that comes to us on account of the sin of our first parents. There are also things in Scripture that show temporal punishments coming to us on account of our own sins. A good example of that is King Solomon. King Solomon, as we know, strayed towards the end of his life, and God told him that because of his sins with various foreign gods, he was going to remove the kingdom from Solomon, but because of the faithfulness of Solomon's father David, he wouldn't do it in Solomon's lifetime, but in the lifetime of his son, and he would still leave one tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, under the control of Judah. So we see there not only the reality of, of uh, temporal punishments, but also the fact that they can be ameliorated based on someone else having pleased God, which is a principle that's important in Catholic theology. Uh, I have a book that's going to be coming out this fall. Uh, the tentative title is Exploring Salvation, though that may not be the final title, but in that I have several chapters 
dealing with uh, temporal punishments and uh, their basis in Scripture, and I go through countless examples of precisely this kind of thing. So I'd encourage you to look for that. I think one of the verses, lots of verses in the New Testament that point out this presumption that, yes, because of Christ's sacrifice, he has paid the penalty for our sin, but the presumption that, therefore, it doesn't matter what I did in the past or the present or the future, it's just taken care of. There are lots of verses, and one that I was thinking of that in Galatians, Paul is writing to Christians. Mm -hmm. He's writing to Christians who, because of Christ's death and resurrection, they are saved, all right? But then he says in, in chapter 5, the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness. That's not a very biggie, but pretty common, huh? Mm -hmm. Acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, factions, there's a few of those, uh, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Right. That is awfully clear. It's awfully clear. Also, a good place to turn to is the book of Hebrews, looking for t examples of temporal punishments in the New Testament, where um, the author of Hebrews says God disciplines us because we are his sons, and every son whom he receives he scourges. And so, as a result, I mean, those, those scourgings come to us because of our sins, and it's very clear even though we're forgiven. Okay, let's take our next caller. This is Ed from Pennsylvania. Hello, Ed. What's your question for us? Greetings. How are you doing tonight? Just fine. Uh, Jim, were you PCA? Yes, uh, I was. I was Presbyterian Church of America or PCA. Yes, so was I, and now I'm waiting for the Easter Vigil. Oh, congratulations. Uh, Welcome <laughs> God home. has a great sense of humor. Oh, he does. <laughs> Jim, uh, baptism works ex opere operato. It, it accomplishes exactly what we, we're showing for. It brings us into new life in Christ and... Romans 6 says we're baptized into his death, resurrected to this new life. Why then does the church not picture this better by immersing as they did in the writings of the early fathers in the first and second century? You better explain what he says because it sounds like a disease or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, when, uh, when, when the phrase ex opere operato is used, it means that the sacrament operates uh, because I'm gonna, I'm, this isn't a translation of the term, but this is how it, what it functionally means in theology. It means that the sacrament operates because God has promised that he will work through it. And so if you do the sacrament, intending to do what God meant you to do, it will take its effect. God promises that, that he will make that grace available. And it doesn't mean, incidentally, that the sacraments convey grace magically, regardless of your personal dispositions. If you are coming to baptism and you haven't repented, you are actually committing a sacrilege. You're not only not going to get grace, you're going to incur mm. new punishment. And that's something that's true with any of the sacraments, the Eucharist and confession included. So, um, so we have to be properly disposed to receive God's grace. It's not a magical guarantee. Now, in terms of uh, the practice of the church using uh, immersion, uh, that's dunking, uh, rather than infusion or affusion, which is pouring, that's something that varies depending on which rite of the church you're in. In fact, in the Latin rite, which is the rite most Catholics are, are members of, in the Latin rite, uh, immersion is permitted. It's simply a question of whether it works out in a particular circumstance. And that's something that we see all the way back into the first century. There is a first century document called the Didache. It was written around the year A.D. 70, 70. And in the Didache, when it talks about the method of baptizing, it, sa it offers three possibilities. The first thing it says is that if you're able, baptize someone in running water. That would be in a stream or something. It says, uh, if you're not able to do that, then baptize them in standing water. And if you're not able to do that, then pour water over their head three times, as you say, the in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so right there in the first century itself, we see a diversity of practice in the church regarding how baptism is to be done. And this brings up something that you and I were talking about before the program, because as Protestants, in trying to figure out what is the correct mode of baptism, we were forced to look around in Scripture for little hints and clues because it's never directly stated what the correct mode of baptism is or who the correct recipients are, whether it's only adults or adults and children or what. It never comes out and says it. And the reason for that is because the New Testament was written to Christians. They'd already gone through baptism. And so they knew what the modes and the recipients for baptism were. And so Scripture presupposes 
that you're going to look to the practice of the church to tell you what the correct mode and recipients are. And so for, we're not meant to have to look around for little clues. That's why it doesn't say it. It's because we're expected to look to the practice of the church to tell us those things. Thank you. Let's take our next email. This comes from Joseph Roloff, CC, Salesians of St. John Bosco. Thank you for your email. Uh, dear Marcus and Janes, you do a wonderful job. My question tonight is, could you give a definition of worship? Also, could you tell us the difference between praise and worship? Many thanks, and God bless. Well, that's a bit of a tall order. Um, <laughs> the uh, worship is, yeah, is, minutes, is so. more of an experience than anything else. One's tempted to, to, to quote Larry Armstrong and say, if you have to ask, you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the roots of the word worship in English would suggest attesting to the worth of something, attesting to the supreme, infinite worth of God. Um, in general, though, I would say that worship is any means by which we do that, by which we attest to God's worth, by which we humble ourselves before him and declare his, his greatness. Praise, in particular, is where we discuss verbally or mentally uh, the different aspects of God's greatness, but we can worship without praise. Worship is the larger category. Um, praise is, is a specific form of worship. Worship can include silence. just an, a silence and an inarticulate just sense of the presence of God and a desire to be in union with Him. And that, it can be a form of worship even if it never finds expression even mentally in words. Last question. How has becoming a Catholic drawn you closer to your Lord Jesus Christ? It's made all the difference. I, I had a heart for, for Christ even when I was uh, an evangelical, and becoming Catholic has brought a real sense of peace and completeness to my life that I never had. When I was an evangelical, I thought that I had to do everything on my own. I thought that I had to be my own theologian, my own Bible scholar. I had to figure out everything for myself. And it really was, in a way, it was a form of trying to find my own place before God by my own efforts. And what I finally realized after I became Catholic was I don't have to do that. I don't have to solve every theological question myself. I don't have to figure out what every Bible passage means myself. God comes in, uh, in, to me in my brokenness and my uh, finite humanity and extends his grace to me and he draws me close to him. I don't have to do all these things. He's given me the church to support me and to lead me and he comes himself to meet me in the Eucharist and in the other sacraments and that has revolutionized the closeness I feel to our Lord. I remember my own experience of, of each week planning worship as a Presbyterian pastor and it was open game on how he would do it. There was a set tradition in some sense, but it was totally free. I could do a variety of things. I was actually more controlled by the uh, opinions of my congregation than I was by my denomination. In other words, what the congregation was used to doing for, you know, we've done it for 200 years, you know, don't change things. That set the worship more than any bigger tradition. But the beauty of the church is trusting the spirit leading the church for 2,000 years. It's also uh, uh, interesting how we, in many ways, thought the Catholic Church wasn't biblical. Mm -hmm. Surprise. <laughs> how it's I, biblical through and through, and, the, uh, and its worship is a manifestation of that. It's something that uh, gives one a real sense of security, realizing that at last we found not just a church, but the church that Christ founded and that we are where we belong. James, it's a great privilege to have you Thank on you the so program. Much. Thank you for your book, Mass Confusion, uh, in addressing some of the issues we encounter in the church today. Uh, thank you for your witness tonight and also for your work in apologetics with Catholic Answers. I know from my work in the Coming Home Network, the Catholic Answers does a wonderful work in defending the church and equipping Catholics to defend the church where they encounter those who challenge the church. So God bless. And thank you for joining us on the journey home. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Let's remember that verse. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. He calls us to worship as a body, but also individually as we meet Him every day in prayer.
See you next week. God bless. We walk together in the Spirit on the journey home. Thank you.